So hello and welcome. We are going to start with the workshop now. Hi, my name is Lea Gimpel. I'm the co-lead of the project Fair Forward, Artificial Intelligence for All, um, implemented by the German Development Agency on behalf of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I am your moderator for this workshop session. We will start with a short introduction and then we have, will have insights from uh, six speakers sharing in five minutes a slot there take on digital commons and uh, digital public goods. Before we actually make this a real workshop and will break out into working groups for around 25 to 30 minutes, discussing some of the key aspects our speakers will have highlighted in their um, introduction. And at the end, we will all come back here together in the uh, bigger group and share the insights that you uh, discussed uh, in the smaller groups. But let's start with a short introduction to the topic of the workshop. Data is a fundament of today's digital society and of innovative technologies such as artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. But data is also deeply problematic in uh, more than one dimension. First of all, there's a data gap. So there's just not enough data available in order to develop, for instance, um, voice assistance in regional languages and local languages from the African continent. There's just no theory in Kenya, Rwanda, or in Tikrinya. And especially the global south, and here the African continent, produces only a tiny, tiny fraction of the global data that is currently available. So we definitely need, in general, more data. Then we have the whole problem of data access. Most of the data that we have is locked behind doors currently. Or it's very expensive to obtain, which again reflects the power imbalances that we are currently seeing in the digital economy. Because most of the data, of course, is held by multi multinational corporations who use this data to develop their own products, which again then produce data so these products can be uh, improved. And this feedback loop actually leads to quasi-monopolies in this space. And third, of course, there's the whole topic of data bias and uh, representation and data. Because data, of course, reflects our, our world, how we see the world. And this world, of course, is again deeply biased. So who is actually represented in data? How about gender issues? How about uh, marginalized groups? All of these different aspects are currently baked into the data we are working with and we are training algorithms with. So as a German development agency, we do have an interest in empowering partners in developing local artificial intelligence solutions in order to solve local problems. Because we believe that in this technology lays a, a huge potential, for instance, to give people access to data and information or to services by for instance, providing access in, with voice recognition in languages such as, I've already mentioned it, Kenya, Rwanda, or Tikrinya. Because not everyone is speaking English. In fact, only 20% of the global population and only 5% speak English uh, as a mother tongue language. But, of course, we have to tackle a major problem, and this is the access to data and the availability of data. So, by opening up data and discussing um, models such as data commons and uh, digital public goods, we hope to level the playing field for technology development. We also would like to foster local value creation by allowing local entrepreneurs to actually develop solutions for local markets. And, of course, being able to express yourself, for instance, in your own language also gives you the possibility to actually culturally express yourself and to preserve different currently marginalized cultures, which actually don't have a space in the internet and digital society today. And ultimately, with this whole approach of making more data available to the public, we would like to make technology development more inclusive and more democratic. So, this means that we, of course, have an interest in different data governance models, which are now for the non-excludable access to data as a fundamental infrastructure for today's uh, society. And more specifically, we are interested in data as a public good, which means data that is centrally governed, for instance, or data as commons, data that is collectively governed or polycentrically governed uh, by a group of people who are actually producing and maintaining and using this kind of data. 
I have to say that we do have a slight favor for comments um, because they truly empower people in the production and development of data and the use of these data actually. And even comments have a history in the computerized and the internet age, most notably for instance as the free software movement or the protocols our internet is based on or also Wikipedia, which is one of the best known comments uh, currently um, in this world. But at the same time, we also see well that there's a lot of talk around comments and data comments uh, specifically. So for instance, with the AI Comments Initiative, uh, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative, the government of France and Canada are aiming at building the Wikipedia for artificial intelligence. And the Global Data Commons Initiative is under the same roof. However, currently little is done so far in translating this into practice. So how do we actually go about creating these comments? How do we go about governing these comments? How do we go about building an ecosystem around these comments? And certainly one crucial aspect here is uh, the design of these governance models because we know since the tragedy of the comments and the work of Eleanor Ostrom that governance models and design principles for comments are essential in order to make them successful as a third model beyond the state and markets. So in this workshop, we would like to discuss and reflect on different viewpoints and experiences in the creation of data commons and the institutions, the governance models and legal frameworks needed to guide their development. And we will now give the word to our uh, six panelists. Um, the first one here is Renata Avila. She has many different things. <laughs> Among one of them, the member of the Board of Creative Commons. Renata, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lia. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here, like in Berlin, because in Berlin was one of the first places when we started uh, discussing Creative Commons long time, time ago. And uh, it's an institution that will be like uh, next year, 20 years old. So we have been discussing and dealing with the challenges that digital poses to sharing data for a long, long time. Uh, what changed, I think, in the framing and also in the culture of our spaces in civil society and governments is um, at the beginning we, we saw um, content, content creation. It, it was different framing. Uh, we, we, uh, we used to see it as, a, as cultural goods or as, as it was not exclusively a commodity. And when, when uh, digital and specifically data is framed into the commodity space, data is the new oil and all of that, I think that that uh, fundamental change of mind uh, was crucial to um, disrupt in a bad way the future that we were trying to uh, build about uh, digital commons. And I think that we need to uh, have a profound cultural shift right now and uh, stop considering data as, as, as a commodity. And um, the, the proposal here that I want to discuss with you is how can we frame data as common infrastructure? And as a common infrastructure to build projects upon. And a common infrastructure either attached to a community, a city, or even to a country, or, or even better, to a region. That will really de uh, develop the, the potential it has. Um, when uh, Leah was, uh, was talking, I realized rapidly that the same problems of in infrastructure that we have today with highways and with hospitals and with, like, you know, uh, with uh, uh, systems of sanitation, we will soon have with data if we do not consider data this key infrastructure, this key part of our, our digital societies and the way that we build our digital societies. And we, we have a lot of problems because uh, uh, currently our privacy rules, our like trade rules, and most of the rules that uh, uh, regulate digital are conceived with that frame of data as, uh, as commodity. So the first and the most challenging change, uh, change that we need to adopt is precisely that of uh, data as commons. Uh, but it's not only uh, changing data as commons, in, it is how can we um, have who, which authority will have a transparent uh, data handling and, and, and usage of the data it collects? And which rules will control that? 
and who will decide the rules. Um, I think that uh, the best model will be to have data uh, shared according to rules uh, set by the community and, enforce, uh, and, and to have an enforceable gov governance because, uh, of course, we uh, run the risk of, um, f f let me reframe it. First, uh, abstaining from taking a uh, uh, different frame uh, will only increase the power of big tech and will leave us with even a deeper divide, a divide that we haven't seen before because uh, it will be basically digital imperialism, the, the, the problem that we're facing. Uh, second, uh, the, the place where I think that we can most rapidly adopt um, solutions on this is at the city, at the local level, and there are examples of it that I, we can share later. And uh, third, uh, my proposal of this framing is we cannot adopt a new data frame without, uh, an, uh, without the benefits of data sharing reverted back to the communities. I think that we have been exploited for so long, and this extractivism that we already saw with resources and with knowledge and with many other things that should be like commons, like, the, like our, our like forest and environment and water and so on, it cannot continue with data. It, it, is, it will block the possibility to fully exercise our human rights, and not only not economic rights, but also cultural rights is a, is a, is a, um, if we tied our hands as citizens and we cannot participate in building the infrastructure of the future, building the societies of the future, uh, we have a lot to lose. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, one, uh, one notion, if you have questions, please keep them uh, in your mind. We will have the discussion rounds later on to discuss them uh, further into the, in smaller groups. And at the end, we will also have uh, time to, to discuss at the end. Uh, next one up is Alex Klepel. Uh, he's the head of strategic partnerships at Mozilla's Open Innovation Team. He's based in Berlin and he drives the collaborations at the intersection of technology, politics and media to help scaling Mozilla's research and development efforts. And currently he has a strong focus on open voice data and technology. Thank you very much, Leah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yes, I work for Mozilla and most of you know us as being a builder of browsers, but we have a broader topic spectrum. One of them is artificial intelligence, machine learning. And um, one angle we're taking, at least the foundation is taking, is exactly thinking about the frameworks of trustworthy AI. And uh, complementary to that, the Mozilla Corporation, um, the technology builders behind us, um, have two projects uh, focused on voice technology. Mozilla is a, has a history in open technology, but uh, in fact with open data, um, not so much. Um, and these two projects on voice technology are basically also our kind of pilot, pilot step uh, into that area. And uh, why are we focusing on, on voice technology and open voice technology? Because it's, it's not only a convenience factor, but it's um, a crucial access point to information, to services um, uh, of the internet, and that should be accessible to everyone, and not only owned by major corporations. And uh, we've been basically struggling with the same issues uh, the whole ecosystem is struggling. Um, speech technology these days is gated through major monopolies that have heavily invested in the technology and they keep it um, because it's precious and um, a ma major advantage they have is they can collect speech data through their products and these data sets are siloed and basically serve only those companies who collect them. Um, if you want to innovate in the field, um, there's massive barriers. One is, um, as I explained, the technology is bundled in only a few companies and also the data. So what we're trying to do is um, a two-fold approach. One is we have developed an open source speech recognition engine, which is uh, publicly available. Uh, the f fully fledged version will come out next year. You can always uh, tinker and test it already. Um, and the other part is, and this is how we collaborate with the BMZ and the GIZ, um, is called Project Common Voice, which is basically a crowdsourcing initiative to open up speech data in as many languages as possible, with as many accents as possible, and generally creating a broad application of the diversity of voices out there. 
And um, right now, um, we have collected about 2,400 hours of voice data in 33 languages. That sounds a lot, and we are actually the largest publicly available data set, but if you think of for quality production speech recognition, you need about 10,000 hours um, per language. So there's a lot to do, and um, one of the um, interesting projects we're having with the GIZ is actually around um, project uh, digital Umuganda, and it's for me it's fascinating just to see how well it's not fascinating but it's eye-opening to see how difficult it actually is even if you provide the right infrastructure the platform to collect that voice data actually to get in the place where you can start incentivizing people to donate their voices um, finding the right uh, text resources that are license free that can actually be used because otherwise you have uh, uh, license baggage and the technology building on these data sets um, or the technologists will actually need to have legal departments to deal with that. So that stifles innovation as well. Um, so I'm most interested in kind of the mechanisms of how to incentivize people um, to be open uh, to open data, but also to support the entire value chain because data is the foundation and this is already a massive threshold. But then how do you process it? Like who is able to train the algorithms? And I'm not even talking about the application side of things. So there's a huge gap between like even the lack of data and then actually creating services and products that are locally relevant and that are actually sustainable and not only dependent on one player or even singular persons, but that are being shared by um, a multitude of stakeholders that have a common interest and that um, want to build up these kind of infrastructures for the public good. All right, thank you so much, Alex. So that is really a fascinating project and let's hear how it's operating on the ground. Um, the next one up is Odas Nyankuru. He's the founder and CEO of Digital Muganda, a tech startup in Rwanda that is uh, collecting open voice data together with Mozilla. Yeah, um, thank you, Leah. Um, I'll start by, by, by giving um, some statistics uh, about internet connectivity and I'll, I'll dive in why I'm, uh, I'm starting with that. 46.4% um, of the world is not connected to the internet at the moment, and 72% um, of, the, of the population in Africa is not connected to the internet. And I think we can all agree that it's not a problem of, of lack of infrastructure. It's not just a problem of lack of infrastructure, but also a problem of lack of content, especially in local languages. And um, to solve that problem, I believe giving access to people in local languages is one key uh, uh, solution. Uh, the problem becomes that um, the, that sort of data is held by big corporations that will not share it with uh, others and that its uh, innovators are not able to access that information. And it's in those uh, regards that we, we looked at the problem and how cr to create uh, data commons such as, as, as open voice data to solve that problem. But most importantly, how do we also enable um, local innovators to take use of that, all those technologies so that can be able to actually produce solutions on ground. Uh, we partnered with Mozilla, as, as Alex said, and, and, and GIZ, and we are currently building open voice data sets in Kinyaranda, but also looking at how to accommodate as many languages as possible, because uh, with open voice technology, then um, you could think about the, the, the enormous applications, especially since um, African um, um, cultures tend to be oral cultures, and oral tend to be the preferred uh, way of interaction. Um, so if you could think, um, let's say, somebody in rural Rwanda trying to access uh, justice system because they've been facing injustice and they cannot do that because uh, lawyers are scarce and the free legal clinic is at kilometers away, but they could be able to uh, just call in a number and get access to that information because it's, it's in a database somewhere. Um, and the, the barrier becomes that they don't have, let's say, a smartphone to access that information, but with voice technology, you could think about many ways in which they could just dial in a number and, and, and get that information and get access to justice through voice technology. That's why I believe in, 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 in the application of voice technology, especially uh, in underserved communities such as the ones I come from. 
Thank you. Thank you, Odas. And uh, now we have another speaker from the African continent. Um, Baratang Mia has 17 years of experience as a tech social entrepreneur. She's the founder and CEO of Girl High Women Who Code, a software engineering academy for women and girls. Um, thank you, Leah. I am going to echo what he said about internet co connectivity and say that I think for, for us as Africans, it's always important to realize that most Africans are not connected on the internet. And ITU has just reported that in the past two years, um, most of the people who are not using internet are now women. In the past it was 13%, now it's fallen down to 11% of women are now lessly using the internet. And um, there's a lot of data bias. Um, and as women, we do not have access to proper education. The literacy level is very low. So now the people who are creating content and, um, for Africa are still males and we're still mainly the consumers of uh, the internet information. So we are recommending that public data commons must be made available to um, us and especially people who are not using data to build AI only, but to understand and to reshape the future of the AI. And um, in that information, should be made available and freely used that can be reused and redistributed by anyone with no existing local, national, or international legal restrictions on access or usage. At the moment, there's many restrictions. If you want data from government, you have to go through many, many channels to just access data. We're still struggling to find, especially in South Africa, to find out what's the, no what's the number of women who are not being subsidized by government or what's the number of women who are, subs are not subsidized in terms of um, when they want to start their businesses. And that's just a simple, concept, you could just go to the internet and find information. But if you want uh, proper, reliable information, you have to through, go through loads of channels um, from government, and sometimes you don't even have it. So that for us, it's still a, a major barrier. So we think the key to collect high quality data and use it if effectively is by having a, more data commons and having capacity building for us to be able to use it. And one path is to set the standards that will format the data and enable high quality data because at the moment we don't trust it to be easily shared and understood by a normal public person and not to be taken for granted that today it's only because it's up, what's there, it's only acceptable according to um, standards of, of other people. Um, I don't think there's any proper African standards for internet usage or data usage. Um, in as much as we know that data can catalyze innovation and improve services, we are also aware that at the moment we are, there's this overselling of data being the new oil whilst we underestimate the impact that it's gonna have on it with, especially with the algorithms build on the perspective of white males mainly at the moment because they are the ones who work mainly in the um, engineering sector and they are the ones building the future of AI at the moment. So we need more perspective. And if we're gonna say the data is the, the new oil, we need to realize what oil did to the world. When, it, when, it's, when oil has too much power, it creates too many dangers. So we don't want AI to do the same to the world. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, there's already some controversial uh, discussion here. If data is a new oil or shouldn't be a commodity at all, <laughs> let's uh, discuss this uh, later on in this session. Um, then we have an, as the next speaker, Emgada Kazinskaita Budeberg. She's a program specialist uh, of the Knowledge Societies Division in the communications and information sector at the UNESCO in Paris. Emgada, please. Uh, thank you, Leah, for this invitation. And uh, before I start, I just would like to ask how many of you know what, uh, what do we speak about 2019? 2019 is a year of indigenous languages. I don't know how many of you know. 
There are some hands, very good. Uh, and this is where basically uh, my intervention will be focused exactly on um, under-resourced, underrepresented languages. Because what we tend to speak a lot about technological solutions, data processing, and of course artificial intelligence and many other aspects, but we very often forget what we speak really about small number of languages around the world. We speak probably around 50, 100, maybe sometimes we can refer to 500 languages, but in reality, linguists count up to 7,000, and if we take into consideration dialects, we may count up to uh, 10,000 uh, languages and dialects around the world. And what does it mean? It means that when we speak about these issues, we have to address um, data and openness data related to linguistic and cultural diversity. Um, we could clearly see what uh, many of those languages are spoken, especially uh, those which are uh, not constitutionally recognized. Uh, they very often could be community languages only spoken by a very small community. Uh, or those that we already have heard by some speakers before me, but these are the oral cultures which may require as well specific um, arrangements in terms of what kind of uh, solutions we provide. It's clearly what we don't have tools which it would be available for those which are um, well represented dominant languages around the world and the resources available would be much more uh, broadly available and of course opportunities <coughs> provided. So what it brings us to, uh, to one of the key uh, question is how, what do we do with those languages which are not uh, dominant, which are underrepresented? Uh, what are the financial models could be uh, uh, taken into consideration? Because as we have heard, um, uh, if this is a huge investment uh, to prepare full data set, and uh, we probably only focus on those which are economically, financially interesting for the companies and as well um, organizations which are involved in this, um, in this work. Um, UNESCO has a World Atlas of Languages in Danger, which will be changing next year to World Atlas of Languages. But we clearly can say today that from, those, um, from data what we have, that around 40% of uh, linguistic diversity around the world is in danger. Some of those uh, languages are vulnerable. We are present online. We have as well all written systems which could be used uh, for providing uh, access to, to, to information in those languages and resources. But uh, what we clearly see as well, that a uh, majority of those languages which are in danger are spoken by uh, fewer than 10,000 speakers. So it means economically it's really not interesting uh, to actually document those languages unless we are really interested in the cultural, linguistic, diversity, heritage, if we're interested in traditional knowledge, passing um, historical um, information to next generation or so in some cases, for instance, uh, discovering new traditional practices, uh, traditional practices which could be converted into profitable uh, solutions in any industry. So this means that basically uh, our technological solutions very often have to be based exactly on audio and video files and on and different solutions provided and not necessarily on one what we would uh, imagine would be written systems. Um, so another important issue is what I want to bring uh, to your attention, what um, as we involved in international of indigenous languages, and it's only one uh, month left, but we could see it clearly what around the world we had more than 900 um, international events taking place at different levels, whether it would be institutional, uh, higher educational institutions, whether it would be governmental organizations, private organizations, and many other ones related to capacity building workshops and uh, presentation of diff different solutions. But one thing what it comes out clearly, what, what means public and open data for us, it doesn't mean necessary for communities the same way. Um, uh, in some communities, we clearly see what it affects as well, the way um, communities see um, the understanding with uh, external world, and uh, there is a need of clear um, and direct communication with communities where we really the data and communication we have with those communities collecting this data is fully understood by community because very often we clearly see it what um, sharing something means as well giving away. 
And that means what we have to explain to communities, to language speakers we work with, what um, something will be returned. And I would echo those few speakers before me who said what we have to return this as well to communities. It's not only for industry, it's not only for the public goods, but as well something which it could con uh, um, concretely mean uh, for the communities themselves. So therefore, we have to address issues related to privacy, to intellectual property issues, and we have to be, of course, clearly um, and well discussed with those communities. Um, what are the sustainable governance models uh, for data commons? I would say, of course, multi-stakeholder approach is one of the commonly used approaches, but I would as well come back with the data, especially one which is provided by language communities, should be owned uh, by communities. And we could decide whether it is open, free, or it's preparatory, or, or other things. Um, we as well have to clearly define what we want with those um, structures, infrastructures. What is the purpose? What is, um, uh, what is objective? what are expected outcomes because sometimes um, data collection for the sake of collection data it's, it does not lead much we have of course to convince what this data has a value not only just uh, for community but as well could have a value for humanity uh, so uh, here it brings a question of how data what we collected um, is accurate and scientifically valid, uh, because that gives, uh, brings me to the next issue, but if we uh, do not take into consideration, um, let's say, scientific aspects while we collect data, it is not easy uh, for policy and decision makers to integrate this data in decision making processes. And for instance, for us, like inter intergovernmental organization like UNESCO, we frequently discuss with our uh, department, uh, with our Institute for Statistics, which is an official body to collect data, um, statistical information for UN agencies, and which has access to many uh, national uh, department of statistics, where alternative ways of collecting data are not necessarily seen as scientifically valid. So there is a need as well to have more dialogue with different department of statistics at different levels, but it would be clearly understood what we mean by open data, how it is collected, where it is scientifically valid and accurate, and um, uh, in order to avoid situations where data by default is rejected. Uh, and that's a very important point because if we want to integrate this and then see as a, um, data commons would, would be an instrument for, um, for innovation policy, uh, this aspect is important for, for, for formulation of, uh, of new policies uh, and, and solutions. Uh, so that would be for, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amgana. So, raising a lot of interesting questions. For instance, how to define the purpose uh, of the data use, and that is certainly uh, something that needs to be done collectively when we are talking about comments. So, as a last speaker, we have uh, K.S. Park. Uh, he's coming from the Korea University, and he's also the director of OpenNet Korea, a digital rights organization. Um, and he has worked on key open data movements in the country such as court judgment databases, the right to be forgotten, and the use of pseudonymized data and other things. Park. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about something that uh, people in this room probably don't want to talk about being too nice. Um, basically, data protection law. Um, databases of uh, court decisions are the treasure trove of uh, information about a society and its norms and practices, uh, but are most often suppressed into silos reserved only for judges in different countries, most often for the reasons of uh, data protection for the people involved in the dispute, or for the reasons of uh, personality rights of the people uh, involved. Um, Korea, uh, in Korea, uh, less than 1% of uh, the Supreme Court's decisions are published. Uh, less than 0.5% of lower court decisions are uh, made available publicly. Um, all for reasons of uh, uh, data protection. So what arguments can we uh, make to unleash the communal power of such databases 
to make the society more just in dispute resolution, make the economy more efficient in resource allocation. Um, I want to propose a certain idea, uh, the idea of uh, data socialism, uh, which is not very far from what people have said so far. Uh, Renata talked about data as a uh, infrastructure. Um, well, if data is an infrastructure, then it should be socially owned and socially uh, controlled. Uh, let me give you another uh, example why we need to uh, take head on the challenges of uh, uh, making reconciliation with the data protection law. We talked about how AI may not function fairly or ethically. Um, now, uh, Amazon shut down its hiring system because uh, it could not uh, fairly select uh, uh, female uh, candidates. Um, how do we solve the problem? Uh, some of the facial recognition technologies are being shut down because they don't recognize uh, African-American faces uh, correctly. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the AI functions are limited uh, may be because there is not enough data about uh, women who have uh, made successful careers in the Amazon hiring system. Uh, it may be because, uh, as uh, one of the panelists said, uh, people making the system uh, have not collected uh, enough data about African American communities. But what are, you t what, what are you saying here? I mean, then do we need to go out there and collect more data from them? That means less privacy for them. Uh, that means uh, less data, pro uh, that means less data protection for them. Um, what ways, in what ways can we come out of this uh, self-defeating uh, dilemma? Um, so we come back to this idea of uh, data socialism. Um, in a way, data, personal data, is born social. I'm a law professor. People call me Professor Park. But I cannot be a professor alone. I'm a professor only to the extent that there are students willing to sit and listen to my lecture. Um, my identity, uh, my identity or my job as a professor uh, is something I cannot own or control. It's not something that I can prohibit other people from sharing just because it's about me. Because that facet of me was not born entirely from me, but it, it was created socially. Of course, I mean, socialism has nothing to do with whether the property, uh, whether, uh, uh, whether the commodities uh, come from social sources or not, but just in advancing the argument why some of the personal data, if not all, should be considered uh, public resources instead of uh, uh, libertarian commodities. Uh, um, I'm, you know, to, 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 to advance the argument, I'm, uh, uh, I'm making that uh, observation. Uh, this idea is not necessarily an opposition to data protection laws. Um, data protection laws, uh, the actual mechanics of it is built on the metaphor to data ownership uh, that you own your data, but I mean, that statement is uh, cyclical, right? If you if it's yours, then that means you own it already. Uh, what's really meant by the statement is that you own data about yourself. But then again, data about yourself, as I said before, 
has social origins. Uh, my job, uh, I mean, even in the uh, uh, structuralist, structuralist uh, philosophy, um, I mean, what is a tomato? Is there substance to tomato-ness? We all know that there is no such thing. Tomato is tomato only because it doesn't have the features of other fruits or vegetables. Uh, it's all relative. So uh, the identities, personal identities, come from uh, relations with other people, relations within the communities. Another reason to uh, think about uh, communal uh, ownership of uh, some of personal uh, data. Now, uh, the uh, proponents of uh, data protection laws themselves understand that data ownership uh, is supposed to be only a metaphor, uh, not the uh, actual uh, truth uh, by which uh, privacy is to be uh, protected. So there are exceptions carved out of data protection laws. Uh, for instance, uh, Singapore, India, Canada, Australia, they all have exceptions to publicly available data, just as uh, Germany uh, used to have until uh, 2017. Um, so, uh, well, I'll stop there for now, and uh, I'll uh, develop more in questions and answers, if you have any. Thank you, KS. So now it's actually time for working groups. Um, I already said this in the beginning, it's a real workshop, so uh, you have also to do something, dear guests, uh, namely forming groups now, let's say three or four, uh, maybe in the corners of the rooms, and you have 25 to 30 minutes with the speakers to discuss your questions that you have, which came to your mind during their statements, and they also prepared some guiding questions for the discussion. Um, I would put forward maybe to go uh, in, about it this, in this way, that uh, Renata and Baratang can team up and uh, discuss um, institutions and governance structures and inclusiveness um, of efforts uh, to build data commons. Then we will have a group on community efforts to build data sets, incentivizing structures and building an ecosystem around a specific data set with Odas and Alex. And as a third group, I would propose to have um, Mgada and uh, KS to discuss privacy, data socialism, and the right not to be represented, repre be represented in the data. Um, yeah, please spread around the room. If there is a fourth group which would like to form, uh, please feel free to do so. The only important point is that you have someone who can at the end um, be a rapporteur and wrap up what you've been discussing in the next uh, 25 minutes. Thank you.
So hello everybody. I hope you're having inspiring discussions, but I need to ask you to come back to the bigger forum now and share your insights. Okay, once again, we have to wrap up here, so please come back to uh, the forum and um, let's see what you have been discussing. Okay, so time is ticking. Uh, please come back uh, to uh, the bigger group and um, stop your conversations at this point so that we can all learn what you've been discussing so fiercely. Okay, I think it's actually a good sign that you are still um, discussing, which means that there's a lot of energy in the room, even at this uh, point in time, and I'm sure it was a long day for all of us. So we have, I think, um, a few minutes left. So I would like to learn more about what you've been discussing in these three groups. Do we have three rapporteurs who can quickly wrap up the discussions. Okay, so Daniel will start with the group on incentivizing mechanisms and building communities. Thank you. Okay, I hope this is working. Yeah, it's working. Cool. All right, so our group basically looked at um, the supply side of things. How do you collect data sets um, and the demand side, so what, what could be done or who could be interested in using those data sets um, with Alex and Odas. In terms of data collection, um, we looked at incentive mechanisms. Uh, Odas from, from Digital Umuganda uh, actually shared with us their approach, which is to do the data collection um, basically leveraging on an existing uh, voluntary community day that happens, uh, I think, once a month in, in Rwanda. 
and that idea of uh, sort of self self care and cooperation to collect data, and they do, they do that together with universities and schools to collect the data sets. They are using a technical platform that is uh, provided by Mozilla, which Alex presented earlier, the Common Voice platform, which is basically crowds offering offering a platform for crowdsourcing the data. There was another interesting example from the project Wheelmap, which uh, builds on OpenStreetMap infrastructure for collecting information about accessibility in places, also a lot with schools, uh, students, voluntary contributions. Um, what was interesting was we also talked about biases in data collection. For example, with a common voice, they find that there's a lot of male voices. Uh, so even though in theory, crowdsourced data could be balanced, in practice you find that the people who crowdsource are actually, you know, there are biases and representations there, and there's a challenge there. And on the demand side of things, um, we talked about, um, let's see, from, from, from the run-in side, for example, that uh, they are working on a larger ecosystem around voice data, universities, entrepreneurs, media companies, um, public institutions that are all interested in using this, this um, voice data sets and the voice recognition models. We also talked about the preserving of languages, um, and there was one gentleman who talked about a language uh, that, um, I, I didn't get where you were from. From Belarus. From Belarus, exactly. And that was the language that is being sort of re, uh, re recorded by their audio samples. And, and he asked whether Mozilla would be able to incorporate that into their platform. And it, theoretically, technically, it would be possible. But then the question comes down to the license, which was quite interesting because they use the CC0, so a very open license. Uh, last but not least, in terms of challenges on the demand side, it was very much about expectation management because building a voice data set in this case takes a lot of time. It's not something very quick. And another issue that was raised that open access to such, such data sets doesn't necessarily mean equal benefit or equal usability of these data sets because you also need people with the skills to make use of that data. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daniel. This is what quite uh, comprehensive, uh, I'd say, being part of the discussion group as well. Um, let's go to, um, well, Case Park or Renata or who would like to go first with the group and who is um, Philip, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so we basically started with the idea of data socialism, um, <laughs> which well, maybe obviously um, was quite controversial, but we talked a lot about communities and the rights of communities um, in terms of, well, protecting and also benefiting from the data that is collected about them. Um, so we, for example, talked about how scientists, researchers, etc., cetera, um, interact with indig indigenous communities and um, perhaps not collect data, but at, po uh, at some point um, extract data. And then the idea came up, okay, when, at what, at what point is the uh, raw data uh, part of the community and at what point does the researcher or any other institution um, make a data set out of the raw data and presents it as something new. And then the question is, okay, who, who owns the raw data? Okay, then you maybe have a more direct link to the community, but once it's a data set, it becomes more complicated, right? Um, so there's a disconnection between the data and the subject in the research and how in the end you're going to use it. Um, and the second part of the discussion focused more on the data socialism part and how personal your data can be because you're always embedded in relations to, well, not only other people, but also in a social environment, in a community. So I think if I got the idea right, what Kyungshin Park tried to explain with data socialism is try to moderate these, this metaphor of data ownership um, and that this would lead to a more nuanced approach to data protection. But from the discussion, I, I think what came out is everybody came up with different kinds of examples um, where um, a blanket approach to data protection would not work. And if you, if you are advocating for a nuanced approach, then it is basically it goes down to every individual case, um, which can become, become problematic. 
Thank you, Philip. And I think last one up is uh, Uta giving a wrap up of the discussion on um, what did we have here? Institutions and governance structures. Is this right? Yes, that's true. Um, so maybe um, to to sort of underline again why we are here, I found uh, one statement very remarkable because we tend tend to forget about it. It was uh, the statement that. Um, uh, What's your name? <laughs> but Taka, I, for, I forgot your name. Uh, that you said that in Africa we need access. Um, we, we are talking very much about data protection here, but in Africa, uh, be it an African country, be it uh, through silos, data is very often very protected. Maybe not in the sense that we think of data protection here, but uh, there's really uh, the need for data, the need for access. So it's not. Uh, it's not a luxury, there is a need. And um, you also highlighted a key question there that just needs to be sort of a guiding question, and that is, does the data that we are producing, that we are freeing and whatever, does that serve the issues of the communities? And uh, you need consent from the communities. That I would put sort of as an overarching understanding in our group uh, on top of this. Um, then we, would, we were discussing about what would institutions for data look like and uh, um, how can we uh, empower people with data. We, we claim that, but how does that translate actually? And Renata was saying, how, we, how can we democratize the tools to actually enable pe people to do something with data? And that uh, connects to a topic that we spend a little bit more time on, um, on how to create usage of that data, be it by fostering the tools or be it also by um, uh, by creating communities that are interested in the data and have the capabilities of, of using it and have, an, have, an, uh, have use cases. And that could be, of course, uh, commercial actors, but it, uh, of course, could be other actors as well. Um, there was the idea to, um, so one step back, because we sort of understood that very often we are demanding uh, the openness of data and we are not yet um, uh, able to show so much that this innovation um, hypothesis that we have that that is, uh, that is holding true because we don't see um, the widespread innovation yet. That was sort of uh, a diagnosis. And um, we believe that this, is, uh, that this is possible, but maybe it hinges on uh, also supporting um, side systems um, for this data, uh, such as journalism, such as, uh, such, as, uh, such as science, for instance, people who can use that because not everybody will become a data scientist. And um, in line with that, um, we were uh, trying to think about the encouragement of innovation and the use of data um, to, um, for instance, um, address the question of, um, uh, of, of what other drivers uh, for use cases could be. And uh, there was the, the sort of the, um, the, the takeaway to think about problems, global problems, where uh, data um, uh, that, we, that we use, uh, that we create, can actually contribute to solving of the problem. One of the problems that was named was uh, climate crisis. Um, so that would be a concrete problem space where we could and should argue for, um, for collaborative data generation that is actually of use because it's about showing that there are use cases for these, uh, for these, um, for the public data or the data commons, depending on which way you would want to go there. Um, what was left open a little bit is the the question that we should uh, include the um, uh, include the challenges of how to maintain clean add and um, continue with data data sources it's not a one time issue but you you have to sort of uh, um, encourage future processes around the data governance um, and there, the idea was sort of held that uh, we should more explore the, um, the partnerships between the private sector and the public sector in terms of maintenance. And another approach, uh, I will close, oh, two, two more, no, another approach I will close with that was a con concrete proposal for funding, because that's always key. Um, the, the rule was proposed that um, for community or non-commercial use, the, um, the data could be free of charge fees could be, uh, could be waived, but that there would be licenses for companies to use community-generated data. That was a very uh, tangible suggestion that came out of our group. Thank you so much, Uta. Just in case. Uh, yes. I, I, I also want to uh, make sure that our group also ended with a, a little bit of promising note uh, by uh, uh, s supplementing the report. I, I also took, took, took the notes. Uh, 
so we talked about solutions as well. So when we talked about uh, data extraction from indigenous communities, uh, capacity building uh, is important. And also there are uh, movements to uh, share uh, data uh, between uh, small businesses because uh, only big businesses uh, have uh, enough data to, do, uh, uh, to, to make good applications. Uh, and also uh, as to the, uh, uh, the, the nuanced approach as opposed to one size fits all approach. Uh, the distinction between uh, private data and personal data were talked about where, uh, where privacy uh, is considered more like a boundary, manage boundary manage management for each person uh, where each person uh, controls uh, the boundaries, uh, boundaries uh, over which, you know, their personal data uh, uh, are not allowed to uh, leave or cross. So the, the last comment was that uh, along the line, uh, the kind of data you submit to uh, telecoms to get phone service. Uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, to complete the transaction uh, should be uh, uh, protected strictly as uh, private uh, data. Okay, thank you uh, for uh, for this add-on. So time is already up, and I'm not trying to do a wrap up of the wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say uh, thank you for sticking with us throughout this workshop. Um, it was, I think, an interesting discussion, and certainly a discussion that we have to take further. And uh, for now, I just wish you a nice evening. Thank you.